Over the past four weeks, Paul has been reminding us of the critical truth of Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's absolutely foundational to our Christian faith that God became human, took on flesh, and lived and walked among us in order to reveal himself to us. And Scripture makes that very clear to us as well. In John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created by him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. God with us. In the four weeks coming up to Christmas, we talked about four principles as we considered Advent. The first was that of hope. Hope that is expressed as an anticipation of something, something wonderful to come. Maybe the hope of that longed-for Christmas gift. Did it come? <laughs> Steering fluid? Really? <laughs> I got a Toblerone bar. <laughs> Wonderful. Or maybe it was the hope of a family gathering, family coming from a distance to be together for perhaps that one or maybe twice a year that you're able to get together. Or maybe just the hope of a quiet, uh, intimate, reflective Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with immediate family. But reminded, we're, we're reminded, though, in Scripture that hope is not just that kind of sentimentality and it's not just wishful thinking. It's a sure and certain hope, a strong anchor for the soul, and it comes from the presence of God, God with us. Paul reminded us, that's Pastor Paul, uh, that Isaiah promised... Uh, uh, to his people, do not fear, God said, I am with you. I will strengthen you and help you. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go, Joshua said to the people. But not only does his presence, God with us, bring hope, it brings joy. And we were reminded of Psalm 16 where the psalmist wrote, you reveal the path of life to me and in your presence is abundant or fullness of joy. And we were reminded of the scene when the presence of God in a cloud, the glory of God, filled the temple and the joy that the people had. And we sang at this time of the year, joy to the world, the Lord has come. But Emmanuel, God with us, also brings peace. We were reminded of that in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God will be with us through the valleys. And Paul reminded us that it's through the valley. We don't stay in the valley. We aren't there permanently. And finally, the last week, Paul reminded us that God is with us because of his love for us. We are reminded that there is no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that love was demonstrated to us, the Apostle Paul says, when he wrote, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so those four principles that led up to Christmas that kind of embody uh, the coming of Christ is something that we've celebrated once more. And we've sung the carols, Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. And now it's over. It's behind us. I have a sister who's a missionary in the Philippines, and she operates a shelter for abused, neglected, or, and abandoned young mothers. And she expressed that kind of ah, feeling in an email to me on Boxing Day. She said this, at least 50 were here at Shepherd's Home at dinner yesterday, and not a few of them were babies. <laughs> but I'm holding down the fort since most of the workers are on vacation. 
it's sure nice to have the Christmas busyness over. And perhaps you feel that way too. So now what do we do? What do I do? Does this build up to an experience of Christmas change anything? Is God really with us? Is he really with me? Does that still happen now after Christmas? I really appreciated uh, Lauren Dempsey asking that question rather poignantly in her rap on Christmas Eve and during our event, The The Chaos of Christmas. Are you with me? Some of you may remember that. The everyday circumstances of life start to resume their regular course, back to work. What will the winter really be like? Are we ever going to get snow? As you check out your credit card balance online, why did I spend that much? Am I going to be able to zero that balance by the end of the month like I should? And and when did you say the kids go back to school? (laughs) Everything kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Epiphany is typically celebrated on January 6th, and that kind of fades into the background. We don't think about that very much. Epiphany means reveal. When traditionally, that's when the wise men arrived to uh, see the Lord Jesus as a baby. He was revealed to them. But I'm not so sure that it was very different in the first century um, than it is today. Even after three years of, crucif- uh, of, of ministry and after the horrendous event of his crucifixion, Jesus' disciples were probably asking some of the same kinds of questions. Is that it? Is it all over? Is there no more? Jesus is gone. He's no longer with us. Is he not with us anymore? What do we do? What are we going to do? Well, we read about one of the things that one of the disciples decided he was going to do in John chapter 21. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. I'm just going to read a few of the verses out of that account. John 21, verse 2. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. And it says, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other of his disciples were together. So there's seven of the 11 remaining disciples who were kind of all together trying to figure out what are we going to do. Jesus has been crucified. Not sure what's happened. We think we saw him uh, in that upper room, but but he's not here now. What's going on? Simon Peter has the solution. I'm going fishing. (laughs) We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he'd taken it off when he was fishing, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. 153 of them. (laughs) Interesting that we've got that simple little number right there. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast. Jesus said. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
So you see, when things seem to be settling down, returning to normal, the tendency is to go back to what you already know. And for Peter, a professional fisherman, it was go back to fishing. Go back to what you've done in the past. The others were quick to join him. But even when we do that, Jesus is not far off. A miraculous catch of fish is one thing, but I think the most important point to this little vignette in Scripture, in fact, it's easily missed. In fact, it's, it's probably my only point this morning. Jesus gave an invitation to the men, and the men needed to respond to it. He said to them, come, bring the fish you've caught. Come and have breakfast. In essence, come and be with me. And I'm sure that as they were eating the fish and the bread, they were experiencing again the calm presence of Jesus, the one who is now the one who had died for them and rose again. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had issued that kind of an invitation to them. He had asked them, come and follow me. And they had to respond to that and follow him. And there are many other times Jesus wanted his disciples to be with him. Come, be with me while I am praying. Come apart for a while. Let's get away from the crowd. Let's, let's just rest a, a while together. But here we have the Lord Jesus coming to them after his, re after his resurrection. And you know, he will not force his presence on you or on me. He invited them to come to him and to be with him. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. But there is something that is required of us. We need to come. Did you notice that Jesus told them to bring the fish they'd caught? And did you also notice that he already had fish on the grill? <laughs> it was already there cooking. He didn't need their fish, but he wanted them to come just as they were and offer everything to him. The Apostle Paul acknowledged this in his first letter to young Timothy when he wrote this. Even though I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man, I received mercy. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. But I received mercy. Many of you have taken that step of accepting the invitation of Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. His name is called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And, and that's what he wants us to do but he won't force it on us. He asks us to come, that we might have eternal light, eternal life. And if you've done that, you need to daily, and I need to daily, we all need to daily accept his invitation to come and dine, to be in his presence, to seek his presence on a daily basis in order that we might have that communion with him. And it's done through simple daily confession, by listening to him through his word, by reading his scripture a little bit each day, and through our prayers of thanksgiving and praise. And it's also done as we come together corporately, as we're doing this morning, to worship God and to worship the Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes I think in our organized way of uh, bringing people together to worship, we tend to forget and to lose the importance of that individual, personal step of coming to Jesus, saying, yes, Lord Jesus, I believe your word is true. I believe you are the Son of God who came the historical and the biblical record is accurate that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth not just to live a good life and to give us a good example, but to die for my sins. And I say, thank you, Lord.
If you've never taken that step to personally say that, you can do it right now as you sit in your seat. I told you that I thought grade five was one of my favorite grades to teach. And I remember back in the 60s and 70s and maybe even into the 80s, when the Gideon International people would come around to the schools and give out these little Gideon New Testaments. Usually they were red. This one is gold to remind me how old I am. <laughs> because they gave out gold ones on the year of Canada's 100th birthday, 1967. So I've had this since 1967. And the Gideon a person who would come around would also offer one to the teacher. And I gladly accepted it and said, thank you. And uh, as he kind of gave a little account of what the, what the New Testament is all about, he would turn to the back page of, the, of the, the New Testament and show them where there's a little statement written where these 10-year-old grade 5 students could make that personal commitment. And it says this. My decision to receive Christ as Savior, confessing to God that I am a sinner and believing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross and was raised for my justification, I do now receive and confess him as my personal Savior. You know, there isn't a specific code that you have to use. You don't have to say those exact words. What did the thief on the cross say to the Lord Jesus when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise? Did he have that little phrase to, to read off and to say to Jesus on the cross? Three simple words. Lord, remember me. That's all. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Emmanuel, God with us. And God can be with you through simple confession and asking him to be your savior. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that just now before we have communion. James Peters, one of our elders, is going to lead us in communion, but and as we do it, it's a tangible expression back to God of the commitment that we've made. I'm going to ask us just to sit quietly and sing as uh, Ben and uh, Dave come up here to lead us. We're going to sing a, an old hymn that some of you will know very, very well. But because it's old and some of you are young, you may not know it at all. <laughs> it's a hymn that was sung thousands of times to millions of people as the evangelist who became known after his death or perhaps even before his death, Billy Graham, known as America's pastor, used to sing and have sung at the end of the crusades that he conducted around the world. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. We'll sing, and then we'll have communion.